Okay, good. Bye and moderate our conversation ourselves. We'll maybe start with a quick round of introduction of the panelists uh, and, and get into the conversation. So I'll, I'll go first. I'll, uh, uh, I'm Rohit Guy. I'm CEO of Arase, uh, uh, sort of a heritage company in the cybersecurity space. And it's uh, great to be here. Uh, so I'll maybe pass the baton over to you, Tracy. Um, sure. So Tracy Reinhold, I am the Chief Security Officer for Everbridge. Uh, we are a critical event management company uh, on a SaaS platform, and I come to the private sector after a long career in the federal government, uh, where I retired as the deputy for national security for the FBI. Dimitri? I'm Dimitri Shaparovich. I'm chairman of Silverado Policy Accelerator, which is a new think tank um, that I co-founded here in Washington, D.C. to try to accelerate policy on cyber issues and some other things. And I um, was previously co-founder and uh, CTO of CrowdStrike, now one of the largest cybersecurity firms in the world. And Zuka Avram, uh, co-founder and CEO of ZecOps. Uh, we do mobile EDR and mobile DFIR uh, investigations for iPhones and Android. And I previously co-founded uh, Zimperium. Perfect. So it feels like we have a very good representation in the panel, right? We have sort of uh, a couple of us from the vendor side. We have, as uh, you know, some practitioners and, and then also uh, Dimitri, who's working it uh, from the policy side uh, as well. So hope to have a great conversation. And I think uh, while we await our, our moderator, the first question he had intended to ask us was related to you know, what this new world means for cybersecurity as it pertains to the, you know, the impact of the pandemic and the impact of the, I guess, the remote, uh, you know, remote work workplace. So uh, maybe just, let's just get some thoughts from uh, each of the panelists on that. Maybe uh, start with you, Tracy, again, and we'll go around the horn and uh, yeah, sure. I, I'll, I'll go at the very end this time. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I was, uh, I hosted an event this morning uh, with some security practitioners from the EU. And, and one of the topics that came up was, um, the new threat that's posed by remote workers from a cybersecurity perspective. And so the concern was uh, twofold, really. Uh, number one, uh, that the uh, companies are allowing employees to use a, a sort of a BYOD device. Uh, which may not lend itself to the same degree of scrutiny that a company issued device would give uh, to an employee. Um, the second thing is really about insider threat um, as it relates to the remote worker and how we, all of the telltale signs that we used to use in the past uh, to, in, to show the indicators of an insider threat, the logging on at midnight, et cetera, well, that no longer applies because there's no set schedule anymore. And it also lends the remote worker to uh, to be more susceptible to social engineering uh, based on isolation. So I think those are some of the things that we looked at uh, this morning uh, when we looked at from a, an employee perspective on how we address the cyber pandemic, the pandemic that we've just gone through and that we're slowly emerging on the other side of. So, so that's sort of where my focus is. Uh, when it comes to that, um, from insider threat uh, to the security of our own uh, devices that we're using across the spectrum in our companies that may not uh, be to the same level of scrutiny that our company issued devices have been. Very good. Thank you, Tracy. And I see that we've been joined by Ed. Uh, Ed, welcome to the panel. Uh, we are kind of adapting on the fly, as you may have noted via email. Our monitor is, uh, is, is delayed. So we are beginning the conversation in, in his absence. And uh, so maybe, maybe we'll kind of break the sequence and we were getting into the impact of the pandemic and the remote workforce on cybersecurity. But maybe we'll, uh, we'll let you introduce yourselves and then we'll go back to that question. 
and maybe uh, maybe after introduction you can you can kind of go in that flow and talk about how you think cybersecurity is changing in the post covid era and the new world that we live in now no absolutely um and i'm always good with <laughs> Uh, definitely going a little bit more dynamic. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ed Cabrera. I'm the Chief Cybersecurity Officer at Trend Micro. Uh, been there about five and a half years. Uh, it's been a great transition for me because before that, I spent 20 years in the U.S. Secret Service working in and leading different cybersecurity programs at the Secret Service uh, from our computer forensics program, network intrusion responder program, and ultimately uh, deputy CISO and CISO. Did a little bit of time at DHS uh, as an advisor from the Secret Service to, to the NKIC and US CERT. So in a nutshell, that's my background. Uh, as far as the pandemic and, and, and truly what has been sort of changing the landscape, I, I think all of us um, have the similar take on it and the similar challenges. Uh, so as not to repeat what possibly somebody else has said, but I think arguably it's just changed uh, more than anything else, uh, the, this cultural mindset. You know, when we talk about um, uh, user experiences, be it from consumers to employees, I think uh, this whole notion of going remote um, really has extended, you know, the attack surface. All of this is not new. We talk about this on a daily basis, but I think the challenge that it, dri it drives is not just the challenges that we already know, but what are the opportunities? What can we actually then leverage from this? What other cultural barriers have prevented us from an organization to embrace a culture where you have a distributed workforce, where you can actually leverage more talent, um, you know, in a distributed manner, uh, whereas you don't have this uh, fixed uh, notion of people have to report to a office, a city to be productive. So I think there's there's definite um, positives, you might say, and I'll, 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 I'll my first swing at this, I'll stay positive. And the other piece is the cyber workforce development. I think ultimately uh, we still have this gap, this skills gap. And I know everybody here talks about, and it's probably been a part of trying to, from a technology perspective, close that skills gap. But I think the innovation on the workforce development is pretty much here. And then how do we do that? How do we continue this sort of wave where we can actually um, increase uh, the, 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 I wouldn't say remote learning, but also more immersive learning that we can actually bring to bear now with so many different technologies, AR, VR, extended reality. But I think that's the, uh, I think the opportunity, you know, what we see now uh, coming out of the pandemic and what can we sort of take what we've seen from a threat perspective and, and really turn it into a positive and what can we do from that? Great, thank you, Ed. Uh, maybe, maybe we uh, go to Dimitri. You, you've been at CrowdStrike in the past, and now kind of looking at it from a policy perspective. Your thoughts on impact of the pandemic, you know, in our field. Well, uh, as as my panelists just talked about, um, the the threat landscape um, has only become more challenging um, as everyone gone virtual. But the adversaries clearly have taken great advantage of that. And uh, what we've seen last year is the highest amount of cyber intrusions and, and more devastating ones at that um, than we've ever seen uh, by, by uh, almost an order of magnitude. And, uh, you know, just in the last three months, of course, um, uh, Washington, D.C. has been consumed by two major intrusions um, that have um, first one impacted the government. The second one impacted the broader uh, community. But the government is uh, very much... Um, thinking about how to respond, and that's the SolarWinds um, hack, or, or as I call it, the Holiday Bay operation, because it's actually much broader than just SolarWinds, uh, which ultimately target the U.S. government, uh, but through supply chain of companies like SolarWinds and Microsoft, FireEye, and others. And uh, the, the second one is the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability that uh, is now um, impacting uh, tens of thousands of organizations around the world that are running on-prem exchange servers, which are being compromised initially by nation state actors and now increasingly by ransomware crews that are locking up data and demanding ransom. So both um, huge impacts, although um, in very, very different ways, but really just a representation of how much the 
um, attackers realize um, that COVID is a huge opportunity for them. Um, as we are distracted as defenders, as we've opened up lots of holes in our network um, to make us more productive and, and to enable remote work, um, they're um, charging full speed ahead through those holes um, to take advantage of the situation um, as quickly as possible. So uh, we have still not figured out how to uh, enforce red lines, um, you know, in particular in the exchange hack. This was uh, an unbelievably reckless operation by the Chinese government to hack into not just um, traditional targets that they initially went after, kind of think tanks, dissidents that you would understand um, the regime would be interested in, but to literally, once they realize that there would be a patch coming out um, that would burn their capability to compromise exchange servers, they scan the entire world and compromise virtually every single exchange server out there, regardless of whether the target was interested or not to them. And now uh, people are using, other people are using that access to further compromise these organizations. So that's the type of behavior that uh, we should um, demand um, the Chinese put a stop to. Um, and uh, we need to, to hit back, in my opinion, uh, for, um, for this, um, to, to send a signal to them and others that this type of behavior will not be tolerated. Absolutely. I think uh, that's, uh, I think we have to, you know, while attribution is hard and whatnot, but when we do have, do have some clues about where some, some of, some of uh, these incidents are coming from, we have to hold, hold uh, certainly uh, nation states accountable and kind of, you know, ask for that, uh, ask for that conduct. So thank you for raising that, uh, Dimitri. Maybe, maybe we'll go to Zook uh, and hear his thoughts uh, on the, on the pandemic and the remote workforce as well. So I completely agree with everything that was uh, said uh, so far. I do have a slightly uh, different angle to add. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that attackers are moving more and more into mobile, um, and it's uh, becoming more and clear to them. So if it used to be just when you're traveling, uh, your phone would get popped, and now we see remote attacks uh, all the time. Uh, actually, the visibility on mobile devices is so small that I don't think we even see 0.1% of all the attacks. Um, it's uh, just today, uh, Google published a blog with, uh, with uh, vulnerabilities targeting Android and, 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 and iPhones. Uh, it only took three different vulnerabilities to be able to compromise uh, basically every device that visited uh, these uh, websites that had a waterhole attack. So I, I see mobile actually as the biggest threat uh, to everything right now. It has microphone, it has your second factor authentication. It's your only factor authentication, actually. So once you compromise a phone, you compromise everything. And uh, yeah, and attackers realized that. So during the pandemic, uh, the, the, there was also a spike in, uh, in mobile attacks. Hey, Zook, I'm curious. Is the, so how do you train your employees to defend against that? Um, because if you if you factor that in, with the remote and isolation that's been caused by the pandemic, uh, we're finding more and more people are, for lack of a better term, clicking on things they shouldn't um, when nobody's watching. So I'm curious from your perspective, how do, how do we train our employees um, about that vulnerability and how they should look for it? So there are two ways. Uh, so one of them is a proactively scan devices. Uh, this is, I mean, what we do. So, I mean, it's it's a bit, uh, I'm not sure if it's the best answer for you, but happy to help. Uh, and then the second one is uh, proactive, uh, like phishing simulations, just like, like you have in emails, do the same for SMS. Uh, so we can also help with that as well. Great, thanks. Makes sense. I'm, I'm noting that uh, Raj may have joined us, our uh, our moderator. So Raj, uh, I've been playing uh, playing a moderator in your absence. So uh, you can write, send the check or the email for my services. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so we were just getting into the impact of the pandemic and uh, and the you know the fact that we now live in a remote uh, workforce um, sort of paradigm and implications of that on cybersecurity. And maybe I'll, I'll kind of complete the, you know, there's a good discussion around the panelists. Maybe I'll just add a couple more thoughts to the discussion so far. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that the pandemic has done is, uh, you know, as we've shifted the, you know, the work play and learning to an online setting and home setting, you know, in the home setting, 
I think people tend to uh, let their guard down a little bit, right? So it's a different psychology at play and a different mindset, which uh, I think, you know, as Ed noted earlier, we anyway have a cyber education challenge and kind of a, you know, uh, ch challenge as a community where people don't understand the risk of playing in their digital environments. And in the war, in the, in, in this new configuration, I think, you know, there is a danger that people are complacent or have their guard down, right? When they're looking at some sort of corporate data sitting on their kitchen counters, right? I know we're on a very serious topic, but I, you know, I'll confess I'm sitting in my flip flops right here, right? So, I mean, it, it just, just naturally the environment, I think, tends to, tends to, uh, foster that, uh, and, and, you know, the cyber criminals are taking advantage and they are, to Dimitri's point, being very targeted about it. It, we, we, uh, you know, we are in the fraud detection space at RSA and you've seen a 120% rise in, um, this fraudulent activity. And that's, that's because I, you know, certainly there's more online e-commerce, but also because, uh, you know, these fraudsters are, uh, you know, perpetrating very targeted phishing attacks, right? You know, in the early part of the pandemic, sort of availability of personal protective equipment, as an example, when people are like looking for masks or, you know, com commodities that were scarce, et cetera. So these, these cyber criminals are very, very clever in terms of targeting what is top of mind and playing on our psychology, which is, you know, different in the, in the remote uh, workforce uh, environment. So just a couple of thoughts from my side. Uh, I'll hand the baton over to you, Raj. Uh, if uh, I don't know if you're audio enabled and whatnot and able to moderate, but I'm happy to continue. So. Sure. Thank, thanks, everyone, and, and, uh, and apologies. There's a little bit of rain here. We got. I don't know if it's just me, uh, Raj. You're in and out, mm -hmm. uh, so the audio is, is kind of spotty right now. Yeah, not not. Uh, my sense is the audio is not 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 going to work. So, uh, we'll, uh, Raj, we'll we'll kind of carry on the conversation and we'll leverage your. <laughs> you know, we'll have to settle for my moderation skills as opposed to your expert uh, moderation skills. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll invite the panelists to say, look, uh, you know, in, in light of this change, I guess, uh, you know, if we had to kind of net out a few recommendations for, uh, you know, for uh, organizations that are dealing with this change, you know, one or two sort of suggestions or best practices or ideas to consider, uh, maybe, maybe we can switch to that, uh, that part of the conversation. Maybe start with you, Zook, and go in reverse order. So, I mean, I have two types of recommendations. One of them is, would be for us, uh, and the other one would be for actually device vendors. Uh, and I've been pushing this publicly for a while now, so I'm not sure if you saw this in the past. But basically what's happening on mobile devices is that... Uh, the VBS file in, in the Windows directory. Uh, and that's not hard to catch if you know what you're looking for. The problem is on iPhones and Android, even if they plant the same thing on a temp folder, just like we've seen before in iOS uh, recent attacks and water, water holding attacks on both Android and iOS, or even a data local temp on Android, you just can't see that uh, as an app. Uh, that's why we actually use a, a physical connectivity and check the phones uh, 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 in a deeper way uh, through that approach. But this is just a, a public call to Apple and Google. Let's stop this. Let's work together. Uh, let's provide us. Uh, when I say us, I mean every SOC in the world, every security vendor in the world that is trusted. Provide the capability to actually inspect the entire device it can be with user consent. It can be with user typing the pin code. Perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable. But it's time to work together uh, because it, it only takes three vulnerabilities to attack one billion iPhones. That's it. That's all it takes. And just today, there, there was a, a chain that was released, uh, including its analysis. 
Um, and for us personally, I, I would say if we want to check our mobile phones, uh, the only way is to actually using a physical connectivity. Um, you can try with other ways, but if you want a deep analysis, deep inspection, that's, that's the only uh, possible way. Uh, back to you. Great. No, that makes a ton of sense. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll add a few comments here. From, from, from our perspective, um, you know, if you think about what's happening, the action has shifted away from the corporate network to, uh, for right now, the home network. But going forward in a hybrid working world, it'll be sort of work from anywhere kind of thing, right? So I think in that world, any, you know, the, all the robust security apparatus on the corporate network is not that useful. And, the, you know, the, the onus and the burden of security is more on the edge. So, you know, in terms of what we are recommending or what we are practicing ourselves here at RSA, we think about protecting the action on the edge, which is protect the human and, you know, sort of all things around identity access management, you know, protect the endpoint, um, protect the data on the endpoint, and, 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 and of course, um, you know, make sure that as, as, uh, as these users and uh, are accessing corporate network or cloud applications that you have uh, sort of a control point where you're accessing, uh, ensuring, uh, you know, proper access. So shift to, shift to focus from the core to the edge uh, it, 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 and, and, and then prioritizing your uh, data, right? That's the other piece, like having that deep visibility into the data and where it sits and what data, what subset of the data is being accessed you know, from the home setting and how sensitive it is, just kind of spending time on the inventory of the data assets, if you will, and the value and, 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 the, and the associated risk are some things uh, that we are we are kind of shining a light on. And again, maybe self-serving, but, you know, multi-factor authentication and identity and access management are, I think, table stakes moves that uh, sort of must be deployed in this uh, in this configuration. So there, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, Maybe you'll go, uh, go, I'll hand the baton over to Dimitri, you, you to kind of add any thoughts. Well, let, let me take it from a different perspective a little bit, uh, given that I'm sort of working on policy issues. I just testified in Congress on this, um, in terms of how the government should be thinking about this. And, and I think there's a number of things that we should be doing. You know, the number one threat, strategic threat that we face right now, in my view, is ransomware. Um, you know, nation state attacks are obviously increasing. Get it getting more dangerous, but ransomware affects literally everyone uh, from small companies to large companies. It can put a small company out of business. Enormous cost that um, is being um, passed through to consumers. So, um, you know, attacks on hospitals can, can potentially cause loss of life. Um, and uh, we got to urgently deal with that problem. In my view, the way to deal with that problem is go um, after the money supply. Um, the fact of the matter is we had virtually no ransomware prior to uh, 2009 when Bitcoin was uh, was invented because to do ransomware back then, and there was a few cases of that, but you basically had to you know, deploy malware, lock up data, and then leave a ransom note that says, please wire money to my bank account. Well, as you can imagine, uh, pretty easy to track that down, uh, pretty easy to, ma- to get the money back or make sure it, it never goes to that bank account again. And um, and that just did not work as a business model for the criminals. Bitcoin, anonymous way to pay ransoms, just opened up the floodgates. And I think we need to uh, confront that challenge and um, require what is currently required in the in the uh, traditional banking world, which is KYC or know your customer regulations for major cryptocurrency transactions. So today, if you want to wire someone ten thousand dollars. Uh, through a traditional banking system, they're going to require a whole lot of information for anti-money laundering purposes and and the rest from you. And with Bitcoin, there's no such thing. So uh, we need to start looking hard at cryptocurrency exchanges and other players involved in this transaction and requiring them to do KYC on their customers that are doing these major transactions in order to make it very, very difficult for the criminals to abuse the cryptocurrency schemes um, uh, systems for, for, for this purpose. I think it's... Um, it's a really important thing. Uh, the Treasury Department is actually working on some proposed regulations in the space, and, and I think uh, we all in, a, in the community need to be uh, supportive of that. Um, the, the other thing um, that I think is, is, is really critical, um, and this applies to both private sector and the government, is for us to really start thinking of how do we get the boards of directors and 
heads of government agencies um, to really um, understand how well their organizations are doing on cyber. And uh, the proposals that I've seen thus far uh, have not, frankly, made much sense. In the private sector, it's been all about let's get more cyber people uh, to join boards. Um, I, uh, as a board member of a bunch of companies right now, I think that's a horrible idea because uh, no matter what, the, what your company is, cyber is going to be less than 1% of the discussion that you have in the board meeting. The rest of it is on company strategy, business strategy, product, etc. And if you get a bunch of people that are cyber people that have no clue on how to run the business, it's not going to be a very valuable contribution to the board. So I think the uh, what we need to do is actually figure out how to make the cyber issue more digestible to traditional board members in order to have them not necessarily understand the details of these attacks or even the details of the technology. That's not the job of a board member, but in order for them to understand how well the company is doing, where the risks lie, and to hold the people that are responsible for knowing the attack accountable for it. And for that, I think we need metrics. Um, you know, as a board member, anytime I go into a board meeting and the head of sales presents to me um, um, the, their numbers for the quarter, it's very easy for me without understanding the details of their go-to-market strategy or the names of their salespeople or anything else to know whether they've made their quarter, quarterly numbers or not. It's pretty black and white. Uh, if the target is $100 million, you either made it or you didn't. And I think we need to have cyber be exactly the same way. We need a set of metrics that are encompass how well the company is doing um, and for the board to be able to really uh, quickly see green, yellow, red. Um, what is the trend line? Are we improving? Are we going backwards? And if so, how are we going to fix this? And if you don't fix this, we're going to find someone else who will. And um, I've long been an advocate of speed-based metrics. I think the key to winning in cyber is speed. You have to be faster than the adversary. And um, I think metrics like um, ones um, for time to detect an incident, time to investigate it, time to remediate it, are really get at the core of what you're trying to do, which is prevent breach, prevent damage to the network. So if you're faster, then, then the attackers are able to um, uh, accomplish their objective, uh, you win, right? It doesn't matter how many times they're able to infiltrate. Um, uh, and find a zero day, find an insider, find you know supply chain vulnerability like in solar winds, just does not matter. At, at the end of the day, you, you prevent them from achieving their objectives. And it, the beauty of it is it's very easy for the board member to understand. You know, if this quarter it took you 15 days to find an attacker um, uh, from the time they entered, um, and the next quarter it took you 50, you know that it's it's going uh, in the wrong direction, and someone needs to um, to be held uh, responsible for that. So. That's, I think, where we need to go, both at the government level and the private sector. So, Dimitri, can I follow up on that real quick? Because I think you hit on something that's really critical, and that's demystifying the significance of cyber to a board. Um, so in, in certain respects, articulating the cyber strategy in terms that resonates with the core business makes more sense, and it makes it easy for them to understand it. What I've seen is uh, oftentimes, uh, much like physical security, cybersecurity specialists have their own language. And when they go into the board, the boards are actually sometimes reluctant to admit that they don't quite follow what's being said. Um, so I think metrics are great, but demystifying why it's important, I think, is how we get to those definable metrics that we can track over a period of time. Let me just disagree with you on that because, I, you know, I'm a board member of a bunch of companies. I've been in a ton of board meetings, and I, I've never seen a board member, certainly in the last few years, who does not get that cyber is important. They all read newspapers. They all, you know, follow television coverage. They know it's important. What they don't know is what am I going to do about it, right, because right. they're not technical. And I'll tell you, uh, having had CISOs present to me while on the board, uh, with a, a bunch of technical mambo jumbo that I understand, but most of my board members do not, and look around, uh, look around the room, and everyone's on their phones, laptops, paying zero attention because this is irrelevant to them. Uh, who cares uh, how your two-factor deployment project is going? Um, they can barely spell two-factor. Uh, uh, most of these board directors, um, and, and it's just not relevant to the decisions that you have to make as a board member to protect the company and. And 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 uh, guide the, the strategy of the company. So um, the way that most CISOs present that information, I just think is completely unhelpful, and and they're actually doing themselves a disservice. Yeah. So actually, I think we're saying the same thing, um, and and that is making sure that 
I don't think, I think they don't need to know the mitigation strategies per se. They need to know the impact. Um, and, and it's much like when you're, it's, it's very similar to talking about key uh, critical capabilities when you talk about business continuity, as opposed to everything is important. So everything must be protected. If we narrow the scope so that it makes sense to them, I think that's where, and, and I'm, I'm actually violently agreeing with you, um, <laughs> in this respect, because I think that's what's missing is that you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, when the mobile phone comes out, the attention span drops and you've lost the entire board. And I think if we can keep that from happening, then they understand why cyber is so significant. Not so much about the mitigation strategy and how our cybersecurity professionals will address it, but what's going to be the impact to my bottom line for the company? And can we sustain this sort of intrusion or disruption to our business? Yep. Great. Uh, perhaps, Eric, any thoughts from you on any any other, based on the discussion so far, any recommendations for a recipe for cyber in the post-pandemic era, I guess? Well, no, I mean, I think it's all great topics, and I agree with everybody regarding metrics. You know, it's the KPIs, and but KRIs, it's risks. Uh, I think the discussion has always got to be around risk, but not only for the board, you know, for the boardroom, but it's the server room, understanding and being able for CISOs to sort of lead and understand and tell the their teams, basically, this is the direction and this is the why, right? I think oftentimes we get involved in the volumetric type of, of discussions of, you know, when it comes to cybersecurity. But um, it's all always about why. And, and, and even at the boardroom, why should they get off, <laughs> stop looking at their phones and pay attention to cybersecurity? Like Dimitri says, all of them care about it, but ultimately, how are you expressing the why to them in, in, that, uh, in that respect? But no, I, I think uh, ultimately, you know, that's the biggest challenge that we have now, right? Uh, we are drowning in data and we have technology and uh, security stacks, depending on what company you are and what sector you sit in, you might have best of breeds and, you know, you're trying to struggle to narrow down the technology, narrow down the data, narrow down the ability to automate so you can respond in a better fashion. And so I think everything gets tied to better automation, whether you're measuring risk uh, to report to the board or you're uh, responding to security events. And and so it's all about the automation piece. Uh, so I, I think going forward, that's the big discussion. And how do you increase automation? And, and also, how do you increase the ability, for the skill sets for your individuals that are working behind the automation, right? So be it from data science, data engineers, uh, around cybersecurity, because ultimately it's a data-driven, you know, uh, problem that we have as well uh, on our side. Because without the, the properly analyzing the data, you're not going to get the metrics that you're looking for, right? So um, I think it's that that people, process, and technology. Unfortunately, <laughs> I threw it out there. I apologize, but uh, but yeah, that's that's basically it's my take on what's going to the challenges that we're having right now. Great. Uh, thanks for those thoughts, uh, fellow panelists. I think if I may synthesize, look, what we're saying is cybersecurity is squarely a business issue. And, uh, you know, the recipes that the panel panelists discussed were, number one, uh, make sure we uh, we have a good way to look at cybersecurity and its impact from a business perspective. And it's the onus of the security teams to translate um uh, into KPIs and KRIs and risk metrics that, uh, you know, business folks can understand and make sense of. Um, and in that endeavor, you know, I think it's the collective duty of the business folks and the security teams to ascertain what's important, right? And we are, we are always going to be resource constrained, so we can't address everything. So you have to pick and prioritize and see what's most important right now in terms of, you know, what are your highest risks? What are the likelihood of those risks playing out? And then factor that in into your sort of informing your security posture so it's more targeted. Um, and, and for that, and, and, and Dimitri added the idea of speed, right? It's, it's, we have to assume the bad guys are already inside. It's not about whether they get in or out. It's about how quickly they get to the crown jewels versus how quickly you can arrest and detect them and respond to the, the threat. It's, it's, a, it's a race. 
And in that, in that race, by the way, um, Eric mentioned automation, but I feel that, look, um, this idea of machine learning or analytics to get insight about what's important, right? There is some top down sense of what's important, what's the priority, what are the crown jewels of the organization. But every security team is getting pummeled with security incidents and cyber incidents, and they are not able to handle all of it despite automation. So you have to figure out which ones are more important, which ones should they pay attention to. And often there is this promise of artificial intelligence and machine learning or analytics to come to the rescue. Is that folks, is that real? Is that here already? Is that out in the future? What are your thoughts on the role of AI and ML? And, you know, it, it is a data problem as Eric, you noted, but where are we on that journey to have effective analytics and machine learning to provide that insight so we can be more targeted about which in- incidents really matter. And Rahid, maybe before we go to that, uh, I see Raj actually is trying to moderate by text. So he did ask the question. Okay, Raj, back. All right. In the chat, so maybe we do that one and then we'll come back to that. Since, uh, Raj, you do have the moderating privileges. But his question is, the Biden administration has indicated that cybersecurity is a priority and has elevated several cyber leaders in the National Security Council and the White House. What impact do you think this will or will not have on improving collaboration between government and companies? Or more controversially, is the government even equipped to help private companies? Um, I, I can take the first stab at this, uh, Raj. Um, I, I think it was an incredibly positive step, um, both um, in terms of the optics of it, but also uh, on substance. Um, um, the Biden administration, of course, has created this unprecedented position of national secu- uh, deputy national security advisor for cyber, the highest position that anyone's ever had. Uh, in the White House on cybersecurity issues, and more importantly, put an incredibly capable leader. I think you know Raj Noel, uh, a good friend of ours, and Newberger, uh, who spent many years uh, in NSA, knows these issues inside out, very well respected, and more more importantly, is all about getting stuff done. Um, and um, uh, you know, she's already off to the races and, and doing great work with with her team, and they've done something truly unprecedented in the last um, few days, actually on the exchange hack where they've um, convened this um, uh, government crisis response group on cyber. And they actually, for the first time ever, invited the private sector into that group. Uh, Never been done before. So I think that's an encouraging sign that they are thinking through of how do we partner together uh, with prior companies um, uh, because the government can only do so much. And actually on something like exchange, they actually uh, can do virtually nothing because it doesn't actually impact government networks and, and they have a very limited role to play beyond kind of convener and uh, coordinator. So um, I think uh, those are very positive steps, lots more to do. I think the government in general needs to centralize more cyber authorities in the same way that Cyber Command was stood up um, in addition to its offensive mission to defend the DOD. Uh, We need to give CISA the authorities to defend the civilian government networks. Uh, And, uh, you know, I have this mantra of make CISA the CISO of the federal government to give them the operational responsibility to actually run security for all those networks of 137 plus executive agencies. We absolutely have to get there. It's not going to happen overnight, but um, it's encouraging to see those steps being taken. Anyone else? I can jump any in. Thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I can jump in. Being from the other side, and I'll, t- I'll take a slight contrarian take. Um, being the CISO for one of 22 agencies in the in DHS and actually as an advisor to from service to the NKIC uh, slash NPPD and now CISA. I think the hearts are always in the right place. I think to your point, there's always been, you know, authority without funding or authorization rather. So there's been funding, but no authorization. So there's, the, the challenge is all the way from Anne's position, which is it's just good. And 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 prior to in prior administrations, we've had our, our cyber czars in, in in there as well. I think the challenge is working at in the service post OPM breach. Uh, luckily, we weren't affected by it. But the only thing that we were affected by was the knee jerk reaction that uh, OMB took wanting to bring every department and agency to a level that they weren't willing to fund. So without resources, 
you're going to have CISOs from very small departments and agencies that have a very low critical mission set, or you might have, you know, DOD and or law enforcement agencies with a higher mission critical set. The challenge is, is that they can all get into a room and say kumbaya, but until you are able to match the resources with the need, nothing will get done. So, so there is just too many departments and agencies and too many stovepipes. And so I do agree the centralization needs to happen, but arguably Cyber Command's been building for quite some time on their cyber protection teams. And we still have issues with posse comitatus and this and that or the other as we go forward. So there's, I agree that we're making the right steps, but I just want to caution everybody thinking that, you know, things will be good in a year or two or anything like that. There is so much work that that has to be done. So just to give you an example, post OPM, I had to deal with a score sheet from, um, from OMB. And they wanted truly to get into this continuous monitoring aspect to it. We were all not ready for continuous monitoring. But at the time, there was such a knee-jerk reaction, and that's my only fear with solar winds and so forth, they wanted to put every department and agency's vulnerabilities in one bucket, not in a classified bucket, in one bucket. And so the challenge at DHS, you had 22 agencies trying to put those vulnerabilities into one bucket. So you can imagine this one bucket becomes an incredibly high value target for anybody who's interested in not just compromising one agency, but all of them. So that's my only concern is that we went through this score, this red, green, yellow uh, uh, score sheet, but th- there was no compensating control within the within the model. There was nothing. It was just, okay, you have X amount of highs, you have X amount of mediums, and you have X amount of lows, you know, and you have to remediate within 30 days and it got down to 15 days. Well, you tell departments and agencies that don't that have, have legacy systems, that have, um, you know, funding resource challenges or are out of contract, if you don't if you don't provide the resources at the same time that you're giving mandates, it's going to fail. I mean, so I just wanted to throw that issue in there. I just, <laughs> I think it's a good step, but I just wanted to put yeah. a little caution that um, well, there's so much more work to be done. Couldn't agree more, Ed. And, and, you know, the reality is, is CISA prepared to take on that mission today? Absolutely not. But, you know, my argument is they'll never be prepared unless you give them the chance. So you got to sort I of agree. Sink or swim, and, and we got to at least empower them to be. You know, their name is Cybersecurity and Infrastructure um, <laughs> Security Agency. Yeah. Uh, let's actually have them live up to that name because today they don't. I completely agree. I just wanted to add a comment that uh, I too feel that in the new administration with Ann Newberger, Rob Joyce, and some of the new, you know, so the sort of the experienced players being back at the helm is a promising. Development because from a government perspective, I think it's all about balance, right? I think you can either over rotate towards sort of being sort of too regulatorily heavy and, and kind of, you know, kind of uh, drive too much friction into the system, which will sort of hurt the economy versus you can be too chaotic or not, not enough. So I think, I, I, I think uh, I see sort of, you know, a more balanced approach, but I, uh, but I agree with Dimitri that there are some, some steps needed to, uh, I guess, empower the right, uh, right, um, organizations uh, with their mission and, and set that mandate and, and clear the way for them to uh, to be able to execute. Um, you know, there is there is uh, I've heard heard this talk about cyber labeling and 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 kind of you know uh, uh, most recently there's some some sort of media media news around cyber labeling for consumer products and kind of it's not just about security it's about holding the software industry accountable for making sure they are kind of Lift, shift, you know, shifting security left and making sure they're sort of writing secure code and, and fewer vulnerabilities and better patch management and all of that. Because a lot of times it's, it's not actually the downstream security, but the upstream security that can be most impactful. So my point, my point of view is in addition to investment and security, there is some focus from the government that is needed on the software supply chain, if you will, to keep the software organizations accountable for the quality and the security and the vulnerability ecosystem, if you will. So those are a couple of quick thoughts on the role looks, of the government. Like, yeah, it looks like Raj uh, gave us another question.
Um, yeah, I'm not betting against that. Um, <laughs> simply exactly. because, yeah, we're just not there yet. Uh, and as, as you guys just articulated, the challenge between public and private sector collaboration is still completely onerous. And until we solve that and leverage the 400 pound brains in the private sector to help public sector get to where they need to be, we're going to still face the same challenges that we faced for the last five years. Um, let's see. Uh, do you want, do you want to take this?